And hello, everybody. Welcome. It's wonderful to see you here. I know some of you are still walking through the virtual door, but um, as you do, please feel free to say hi in the chat. Um, I am here with Maria Spies and uh, Martin Bean, who will both be a um, very interactive part of this session. So um, thank you very much. And I'm going to try not to get distracted by all of you saying hi in the chat, but I know you're going to be saying hi from so many countries, as you always do in these. I think we had about five or 600 people sign up, so um, I can't wait to see where you're all coming in from. Um, just before we start the session, um, some housekeeping. If you haven't used LiveStorm before, um, you'll orient yourself very quickly, I'm sure, but you'll notice to the right of your screen is a chat, which is already filling up with hellos from uh, lots of different spaces. Um, you'll also find polls. So we're doing probably about three or four polls during the session to get your input on the things that you'll be hearing. So you'll find the polls to the right as well on the tab just next to the chat. Um, so please make use of those. Uh, we find these sessions are much more interesting when you participate. So um, we welcome one and all to do that. Um, a few other things. You'll notice a tiny little bell um, in the bottom right of the black screen. Now, if you don't want to be pinged every time somebody puts something in chat, you might want to just turn that off um, so you don't get that in your ear. And as with all of these sessions, this is being recorded um, and you get a uh, link to that recording straight away after we've finished the session. So uh, you don't need to worry about typing every single thing you hear as we go along. Okay, so let's get started. We've got um, a very packed agenda as always. Um, so we're going to set the scene a little bit before we start um, and talk about a little bit about where we've been in higher education um, for the last year or two. My goodness, where haven't we been? Um, and then we're going to move on to um, a session which Maria and Martin will take the reins for and work through these four fascinating strategic shifts that we've been observing. There will be opportunities to reflect on what those strategic shifts mean for you. Um, and then at the end, something new, we're adding an optional 15 minute tour of the Holland IQ platform. So we're going to bring in our VP of customer experience, Bethany, and she's going to take you on a little run through of the platform, which will um, echo, I think, some of the things that we'll be exploring in the session. So we're excited about that. Um, you can stay on for that. You can um, disappear and have your late night dinner or morning coffee. Uh, if you haven't met Paul and IQ before, a very brief slide of introduction. Um, we're an impact intelligence platform um, and now working across education, but also health and climate. Uh, we are a very, very global team. Um, we're on a 24 hour cycle a lot of the time. The, uh, the hub, the HQ is in New York. There are hubs in Sydney, in Oxford, in Bangalore and Rio. We have a wonderful array of accents in many of our meetings um, and a wonderful array of customers as well. Um, you'll recognize, I'm sure, most if not all of those logos there from um, universities to some tech giants um, to government bodies and organizations. Um, it's, a, it's a truly diverse and wonderful place to hang out. Um, okay, so here's who we're going to be spending time with this morning. Um, we have Maria, who may wave to you at this point. Uh, Maria Spies is the founder and co-CEO of Holland IQ, um, with a tremendous pedigree in education and technology. Um, been involved in all kinds of aspects, from um, working with edtech founders and venture funds and all kinds of things. Um, um, you've probably heard from Maria before, so I won't go on too much. Um, and our second guest presenter today, Emeritus Professor Martin Bean, CBE, who is our academic in residence. Thank you for waving, Martin. Um, Martin also has a wonderful intersection of technology and education in his background, having um, been general manager of Microsoft in the education side of things um, and uh, launched FutureLearn, um, which was the UK's largest MOOC, one of the first ones. I should get that right. Um, but then also um, runs some huge, huge higher education institutions. So um, if you are familiar with uh, the UK, the Open University, which is, I think, still the largest um, academic institution in the UK, and RMIT in Australia, um, which at last count, I think, had over 90,000 students um, and works across Asia and Australia and Europe. So um, Martin brings a really wonderful combination of, of operational and tech and trends, um, which I think you'll hear when he um, comes in to speak with us. And then Bethany, we will bring in at the end and I'll introduce her properly then. Okay, just um, to set the scene, if you haven't um, 
been with us on this um, journey that we've been on. Um, we've been tracking what's been happening in higher ed particularly closely um, in the last couple of years, and it's been an en enormously interesting place to be tracking things. Um, and along that way, we've been working with, with you and a, an expanding network of uh, professionals in higher education across a huge variety of roles from CEOs and, and vice chancellors, those in academic leadership, those in very technological and digital roles. Um, and the input from this network has really built a wonderfully rich picture, um, some of which has fed into the strategic shifts that you'll um, be hearing about today. And across more than 80 countries, it's probably gone up since we put this together, actually. Um, through that network, we've been sharing regular updates and insights. We ran a six-part webinar series earlier this year. Um, welcome back if you joined in for that. Um, the recordings are all still available. Um, global summits and webinar sessions, and also research. There have been opportunities to um, hop in and out of research projects on really current issues like micro-credentials and digital capability. Um, so you are welcome to come into that. Um, I'll mention that again a little bit later in some ways that you can get involved. Our anchor point throughout a lot of the thinking in higher education has been the higher education digital capability framework, um, which has, it, it's still evolving, it's open source. And so every time we have a conversation with somebody about this, it throws up another question of, is, is this still the right picture or are these the right capabilities? If you haven't seen it before, it's a framework that puts a learner lifecycle lens onto digital capability. So you can see on the left, it starts with demand and discovery and all those um, capabilities and processes through marketing and student recruitment and enrollment, and then into learning design with curriculum design, digital content, subject matter expertise, moving into the learner experience in academic administration, the social side of being a learner, the academic side of being a learner, and then through into work and lifelong learning in the yellow and orange there. And you can imagine that actually wraps around back the things that you learn and the activities more so than ever. And, and Martin's gonna talk a little bit about the education work nexus, um, what happens in that, um, the work integrated learning space um, and careers is particularly interesting right now and wraps around to demand and discovery again. Um, there's lots of ways people have been using this framework. So I think we released it about a year ago now or the latest version of it. Um, and the wonderful thing is hearing people question it, but also talk about the ways they're using it. So um, we know people, you are taking it into strategic meetings and using it as a way to create a shared language and bring people together when you have people from across the institution coming at these wicked gnarly problems from their functional viewpoints and trying to find a framework um, or, or different frameworks that can bring together the thinking and really move along um, progress in digital transformation. Um, there's also benchmarking, um, which comes along with this. So some of you have um, taken part in this where you can self-assess your um, performance across these digital capabilities um, and also rate how important those are. And that can produce, you can imagine if you've got somebody from the learning and teaching team and somebody from marketing and other people from the career center and everybody taking part in this one assessment, the interesting conversations that come out of that when you can see the differences in, in how those ratings come out um, and then where you can take those conversations um, going forward. Um, and one of my absolute favorite things from the last few months has been, you know, if, if the benchmarking and the framework is the umbrella, this takes you deep into um, some of the super interesting detail around how digital transformation actually happens. And that's something we heard from a lot of you early on in the year is, okay, that's, that's lovely, but show me, tell me what's happening. Uh, it doesn't have to be in my country. You know, we can hear, you know, people can learn from any parallel um, example. And so some of the case studies we've released recently have been from Technological de Monterey in Mexico, from the University of Rochester in North America, University of Queensland in Australia, Honoris United Universities, which is a Pan-African network. We've just released another one that um, Maria may talk about briefly from Malaysia. Um, and the beauty of these is that they're taking you into the decision making that higher education institutions are doing around digital transformation. So we've really worked hard to pull out what's the challenge 
um, that that institution has been has identified what were the drivers um, and where was that focus in the learner life cycle and then what was the solution and the decision making around that from not just those basic questions of do we buy in a solution do we build it ourselves do we partner um, but also how the implementation around that happens and what were the digital capabilities that were not present before that have now been built um, the people involved the process and the technologies of course and then uh, the impact, um, the short and long-term outcomes of each of those case studies, how people have measured success um, and what happens next. And often those questions are around scalability and expansion um, and where to once you've done something once or twice. Um, so look out for more of those. I would very enthusiastically invite you if you're looking at that and you're like, we've done something awesome in our university and you need to know about it and we would love to have one of those um, beautiful case studies of our own, please get in touch um, and we'd love to work through that with you. Um, okay, so before I hand over to Maria and Martin, we are going to have a little, uh, we're going to come up to the umbrella again and look at the strategic shifts um, from the top. I'm going to talk through them very briefly. Um, if you've been wandering off, you might want to bring your concentration back at this point because there's a poll about to come in. So as I walk through these, um, have a listen and see what you think. So starting from the left, uh, strategic shift one is around new credentials. Um, so these are the shorter kind of credentials, more flexible from a range of providers. Um, they may be more valued by learners and employers now, who knows? Things are shifting so that micro credentials and alternative credentials um, are very much a part of the landscape now. Moving on to the green box, the education work nexus. Um, higher education and work and skills are so interconnected now. It's, it's very rare that you can have a conversation in a university now without something around industry partnerships or work integrated learning or, you know, where is the employability focus in, in X, Y and Z course coming into the conversation. So Martin's going to take us into that space. Maria will come back and talk about borderless competition, um, the yellow block here. Uh, this one is about new types of competitors and models, including things like public-private partnerships um, and the way that value chains are changing. Um, it perhaps was a while before universities used the word competitors, but um, your competitors as a university are absolutely not what they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and so Maria is going to take us through a few of the nuances around that shift. And then the final shift um, in the red omnichannel learning. Um, so this one is about how higher education is moving to omnichannel approaches to learning and the student experience. Um, it's about what's happening in online and blended and hybrid and high flex and what that means for um, how people want to learn and how we organize our higher education institutions. So in one moment, if it's not there already, Maria is going to um, activate a poll. Um, and we will ask the question, which strategic shift will impact your institution most? Is it new credentials? Is it education work nexus? Is it borderless competition? Or is it omni-channel learning? And I'm going to let you just read those as you respond to the poll. Okay. I'll let a few more of you answer before we comment on what's coming through. It's very even. Sorry, I can't help. I've got a comment already. <laughs> it's good. We must be picking up on all the trends there, Lucy. Look at that. They're all, all coming in pretty similar. Yep. New credential is inching, inching ahead. Okay. All right. New credentials is picking up. Omnichannel learning is kind of about 10% behind at the moment, along with education work nexus. Borderless competition. Maria, you're going to have to fight hard for that one when you talk us through that. Um, that's an interesting one. Okay, we'll just give a few more moments. I know there's more of you that can vote here, so please do find the poll button and hit it. I think this is, um, it's fabulous for us to feel the temperature of the room and, and be able to kind of sense what you're thinking on these. I'll give you a few more seconds. Okay. Lucy, it's Not interesting how that new credentials has remained so persistent over the yeah. last 12 months, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's even within itself as a shift, it's, it's the nuance of, of it is changing um, kind of month to month. And I think that's super interesting too. Okay, that's stubbornly stayed at the top. New credentials, 33%. Omnichannel learning, 26%. 
Education Work Nexus 23 and Borderless Competition 18%. Fascinating. Okay, that is my cue to hand over to Maria first, who's going to walk us through the one that you um, all think is going to, well, not all of you, a third <laughs> of you think is going to impact you the most. Um, Maria, take it away. Thanks, Lucy. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, okay, so that poll was really interesting. Uh, I have, uh, um, today I'm going to talk about new credentials and I'm also going to talk about borderless competition, the first and the last <laughs> in, the, in the race. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm pitching for both, actually, because I think both of them are incredibly important. And, of course, all these um, strategic shifts, they're not completely separate. You know, they're not mutually exclusive. These things work off each other and wind into each other. So let me start with new credentials. Um, we all know this is not new to this audience. You're an expert audience. So we know that, um, you know, the, the long-form learning in post-secondary education is you know, being challenged by shorter, faster, newer types of um, learning and the credentials that go with that and the relationship of these credentials to each other in terms of being able to be stacked and organised and so on. There's a whole range of things happening in here. One is that um, this, this winds in with, you know, the way in which learning needs to continue sort of through life, of course, the demand for that, and also the types of content and the way in which content is delivered. And these things are all related. One of the important things about new credentials, um, as opposed to alternate or micro, um, but it's just new forms, is that this is, this is open to other providers, essentially, and not your, not your traditional um, accredited formal uh, institutions only. So on the screen there, you see some different um, uh, models, some different providers, some different sizes. Um, one of the important things, though, about this is that it's not just one thing. It's still very messy, but it's, been, it's forming. It's forming some sort of organisation in terms of uh, structure, um, you know, definitions, acceptance. There's a range of underlying um, elements that are coming together right now that mean it's not going to be, uh, you know, a flash in the pan and it's not going to be something that's not, that doesn't impact higher educational universities. It's already there. Um, if you um, had a look at um, the number of mentions of micro-credentials or alternative credentials and universities, you'll see a huge amount of, every single university has got some sort of strategy around this, which means they are bringing this into, um, into their, thinking in terms of their own education um, provision. One of the things that's um, really important for me in this whole space is that governments are starting to build platforms to be able to not only create incentives for alternate credentials or, um, you know, other cred new credentials, but recognition of these credentials inside formal national and formal qualifications frameworks. So that is a very, very big trend. And different governments around the world are doing this. The EU is doing it. There's a, something in the US. There's others, Singapore and other um, governments that are already down this path. And so um, those policymakers and regula regula regulators are starting to think of credentials in a broader definition. Um, and so you either need to... Uh, you know, become part of this and embrace it or at least look at it um, or reject it completely. And so most universities globally actually are starting to look at this very seriously to, you know, integrating some form of alternate credential or new credential into their existing traditional credentialing. Um, it is a great opportunity for universities. They're taking up, I can see that all around the world. So this, this is the, the first sort of um, trend or, or thematic. Uh, Martin, you, you've been at the intersection here for a very long time and build a whole range of um, sort of initiatives around this. What are your thoughts here? Yeah, look, it, there's no doubt that, and I think COVID probably sped it up, Maria, um, but this this whole demand now for lifelong learning that I'll talk a little bit about in just a couple of minutes is really on the demand side changing the dynamics tremendously around the types of learning opportunities that individuals and, and organizations are seeking. I think from, from this perspective, though, Maria, your other data will show 
that where this really started largely in North America, the fastest growth in these models now and the adoption of them is absolutely rest of world. Mm. Uh, and and I, I guess as you're seeing every day, it's the sort of trends that every single one of our participants today needs to be paying attention to because it's likely to be happening all around them. Yeah, absolutely it is. And and that brings up, that, that, that links in with the other strategic shifts about new forms of competition. Um, you Indeed. Know, so, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, handing over to you on, you know, obviously related, Education Work Nexus. Yeah, well, first of all, I, I dived in early, couldn't help myself highly caffeinated being here in Melbourne, Australia right now. But I did just want to say thank you to you, Maria and Lucy and Beth for welcoming me to their whole and IQ team. It is such a pleasure getting my hands on the best intelligence available every day and just seeing what's going on in the space that I've been involved in my whole career, which is the intersection between education uh, and technology and, and continuing to play a role in shaping that because it will have both positive outcomes and negative outcomes. And we'll talk a bit about that later in the session today as well to get your views on, on that. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of topics today. I've got the mid-pack topics. I think I've got number two and number three in the poll. But the first one I want to talk about, um, I encounter um, every day. Uh, and I sort of, you know, um, really think that the number one competency for all of us moving forward that will help us in our life and work will be the ability to learn. And that's because it doesn't really matter what statistic you look at. It's clear that we in our generation now, but those that follow us are going to have multiple changes in our jobs and our careers. And that's largely driven by the pace of technology, uh, the disruption in our, our economies and societies, uh, that the pandemic has distorted things further but it's really clear that it's a global imperative now for upskilling and retraining. And, and that is changing the demand side of learners. And there's been some questions in the chat around, so, so what's going on for learner demand? But what's also really clear is how that change in demand is actually lifting the world of work's impact in what we do on the education side. So I think there's four dimensions that I wanted to touch on. First of all, the individual, and it's clear the individual is going to need to refresh and update their knowledge and skills throughout their career. And that's not a nice to have any longer. That's absolutely critical. And their ability to easily or flexibly navigate education offerings uh, actually represents a, a wonderful incremental opportunity for all of us in, in education. We've been audacious enough, actually, Maria, to say the greatest opportunity, which I think by number count uh, and perhaps revenue count would be true. I, I think we've got the evidence to back that up. The second dimension we wanted to touch on is what's going on for organisations. Private, public, governmental organisations are increasingly seeing education as a way to attract top talent, but also to retain top talent as they transition their existing workforce from sunsetting skills to sunrise skills. And, and that means they're going to be a more powerful stakeholder in education. So rather than being a recipient, we're starting to see them to be a much more active player in pretty well every element in the higher education framework that Lucy put up earlier in the presentation. The third dimension is what's going on for us. Uh, as institutions, because as the demand for real world learners grow, we're going to have to think about our instructional design, our pedagogy, um, our program architecture, because it's going to be challenged. Work integrated learning, and I'm doing a piece of work on this along with um, Emeritus Professor Dawkins right now about for the Australian government about the role of universities with industry but it's absolutely clear that work integrated learning will shift from the periphery on some programs to be right as a core component of program design. And we're going to be under increasing pressure to defend the relevance of our graduates to the world of work. And I know that's going to be controversial. And finally, and Maria touched on it earlier, governments are very, very active in this space now. Uh, I see it all around the world. They're, they're launching programs. They're funding initiatives. 
They're coming up with platform technologies to really assist us or put pressure on us to be able to play a more active role in getting their citizens back to work, getting their systems skilled up to take advantage of new opportunities, et cetera. Uh, and, and so that, that's really what's on my mind with this one. And Maria, I know one of the recent case studies coming out of Malaysia, you're particularly a fan of as it relates to what I've just been speaking about. Yeah, thanks, Martin. The Wasawan Open University, I mean, I think this is interesting on a number of levels. Um, one is, firstly, I love that graphic. I keep looking at it. This is a, a university with the old building in the front and the big new sort of shiny building in the back. I think it says it all in a way about what's happening in higher education. Um, but this is interesting because the university, there were two things happening here. One was um, the need to keep their content really up to date. And that's tough when you're talking about computer engineering and, and IT and so on, because things move very quickly. And so um, there was a partnership they entered into in order to, you know, to keep their engineering sort of content completely up to date. Otherwise, they were going to sort of, you know, not, not be relevant for their students. But what I think really interesting is that our, they have been able to redesign and rebuild their degree, for the full degree programs to have the first year as like an intensive, it's online, it's an open university and, you know, we do see um, innovation happening in, in, sometimes in these um, open universities, but um, their first year is, you know, an online, you know, normal sort of um, academic program, but years two to four, is fully integrated combining full-time work and part-time study. So it's like an internship model, but they're, it's part of the university. And so I think that the integration of work and learning is not something that's just like, oh, yes, we've got internships in year three or four, you know, that's fine. But it, it's, it's moving back and back and back into the core of the design of degree programs. And, of course, governments love this. Um, vocational systems around the world have been doing, you know, intern, um, uh, internships or, or apprenticeships, you know, for, for some time. But now we're even seeing <clears throat> um, university and vocational tie-ups to build the best of sort of both worlds, if you like. These sorts of models, you know, have been right around the periphery for a long time, but they're moving closer and closer into the core. And so I think this is just a, a really good example of that. Thanks, Maria. Some uh, interesting conversation going on in the, the chat. One of the themes coming through that I, I think is interesting is how we as higher education are still seeing sort of these new credentials um, and this disruption as sort of being in competition with what we do, with what's been described in the chat as the macro credentials. I just think it's worth saying, Maria, I actually don't see it that way. I actually see a lot of these new credentials allow universities to actually open themselves up to new learners in ways that many of us traditionally haven't served with open universities obviously being uh, the, the exception to that rule. So just a, a little bit of an anecdote. So I'm going to hand over to you for borderless competition, Maria. <laughs> This is a sort of a great segue and I love that conversation. I could be just reading the, the chat right now. <laughs> There's some fantastic conversation going on there about approaches to alternative credentials and new types of students. Of course, these conversations always come back to, but what, but what is our purpose? What is our role? And, and that, that can take a long time, uh, you know, and, and it's complex in universities. So, um, you know, these conversations need to, to keep being had. One of the things about borderless competition, actually, I'm just going to not distract everyone with that for the moment. Um, one of the things about borderless competition is universities are not just competing, if you want to call it that, with each other anymore. The box of higher education is open. Um, the box of post-secondary education or tertiary education is open. There are a lot of competitors in there. They are not now just what's in your local area or in your state or in your country. So it's geographically borderless, number one. Uh, number two, even through the sort of um, vertical chain of, of learning education types from the full stack big credential, the macro credential, I think someone was calling it, right through to smaller non-formal learning. Um, there's competition all the way along. You know, students have got more choices now and they're exercising those choices. Um, 
there are imperatives uh, for, for companies like Martin was talking about before. So we're seeing all sorts of a swirling of new models. One of the new models um, or one of the things that's happening right now is that universities are choosing a partnership model to kickstart or accelerate their own development. And so I think it's super interesting to see the number of university boot camp partnerships in particular, um, because boot camp, boot camps are, the boot camp model is, is operating on a number of levels here. One is it's usually, not always, but usually around tech type skills, cybersecurity, digital marketing, coding, you know, and, and, and so on like that. These skills are, as we all know, in huge demand. And so universities, um, uh, you know, in many cases, you know, I've, I've heard deans of business schools saying, you know, the, the master's programs are really struggling because people just aren't doing them anymore. They're doing these different ways of learning and we've got to, we've got to be there to support our, our alumni and our students. So um, boot camp partnerships are short form learning, um, mostly to do with tech skills, but can boot camp, the boot camp model extend beyond tech? That's a really big question for something for the another webinar. Um, but universities are already building themselves into, into new areas through these models. And of course, online program partnerships, this is organisations, private companies who are uh, supporting and helping universities to accelerate their online programs, it's full programs. And there's lots of things in between. Universities are um, partnering with MOOCs as well um, for short form learning and short credentials and um, degree programs. So they're not, things are not in separate buckets anymore. And so that makes it messy. Um, but what we are definitely seeing is, you know, universities exploring new ways of doing things, whether it be micro credentials on their own or partnering with others. Um, you know, there are new forms of competition. And we, the, the, I can see some things in the chat here about um, new forms of competition. It, it's, uh, it's similar to sort of looking at the white space. You can, you, any, anyone in any competitive environment can look at their traditional competitors, but um, that, that's inside a particular market. But that's not really useful when all the action is happening in a different, in a different market and you're not even watching it. Um, and so this is the thing that's really important. We are seeing um, learners post-school, let's say post-secondary learners, whatever they may be, taking, um, having a whole lot of options now, whether it be universities, you know, we, we have op the top left-hand corner there is universities, Western Governors, Southern New Hampshire, you know, the two largest online universities um, in, in the US. IU is the largest university in, in Germany and doing some very interesting things. It's a university that's doing, you know, sort of t tech upskilling short courses, partnering with other universities all around the world to do so, Honoris, eCornell, ASU, there's plenty. Um, but they are new competition. It's not just whoever's, you know, in your milieu, in your, in your state or country at the moment. And so top right-hand side is just whole different ways of thinking about it. Now, some of these micro-credential providers are in here, but not only, they, they, these, these providers in the top right, the Coursera's Great Learning Skillshare, they are teaching, uh, they're engaging um, millions, hundreds of millions of learners. And in the past, those hundreds of millions, it wouldn't have been hundreds of millions, but maybe it would have been millions, would have been doing degree programs. And they're not now, they're doing something else. And so this is competition. Um, on the bottom left-hand side are all the tech giants. You might think, okay, they just want sort of learning management systems and, and, and infrastructure, but no, actually um, delivering and partnering with whole governments um, to deliver directly B2C upskilling for adults. Yes, at the moment, it's mostly in the tech area, but is it, you know, once you become great at something like that, um, at scale, perhaps, uh, there are other other places you could go. This is competition. And I've, I've put on the bottom right hand side, um, one example, <laughs> it's not, this is multiverse, it used to be called White Hat, it's a UK based organisation. Um, it's not the only one in this category, but it's a really great example. It is a, it's, it's, it's like new professional apprenticeships. And this is this model where they're thinking ar around um, the apprenticeship model has been around for, you know, centuries, of course, in traditional work um, uh, professions. But what about apprenticeships for 
professionals? What about apprenticeships for people in tech? And they're building, an, uh, well, they have built a, a, an apprenticeship model. They've got, you know, tens of thousands of students and it's built in a different way. These sorts of new approaches to um, learning for adults in professions um, and, you know, whether it be tech or otherwise, are 100% competitors to universities in terms of teaching and learning. Obviously, universities have a whole range of other objectives, but in terms of student um, enrolments, if you like. And so I would say that, um, you know, they're, they're sort of potentially to universities, depending on where you sit in the scheme of things, hidden competitors. You don't even see what they're doing, but actually it's really very interesting and, uh, you know, something to, to, to get to know more. Um, and so I would advocate for the, the new um, competitors being a really, really big area. Um, handing back to, to Martin, unless you've got some other comments there, I know we're, we're right on our time. So. No, we're, we're all good, Maria. We'll, we'll keep rolling. Um, yes. you know, one of the things, Lucy, I'm looking at here is, you know, we've got uh, nearly 185 people in this session now from all around the world. And I've, I've got to tell you, part of the role that I play now is I speak to universities pretty well every day from all over the world. And the thing that I'm that in every single one of those conversations is as we are bringing our students back into our learning environments, whether they are face-to-face -face physical or online, what's really clear is that Pandora is out of the box and we're not putting Pandora back in the box. Online, hybrid, and what at Holden IQ we talk about as being high flex modes of delivery are going to be the norm for our existing students, our traditional students, as well as what uh, we think about doing in entering some new spaces that often technology allows us to get into. And there's a few underlying forces there that I, I think are on people's, people's minds. First of all, it's really clear that learner choice is far less constrained in post-secondary education than ever before. You don't need me to explain that, but I'm working in countries that in 2019 saw online learning as basically being a poor choice and not acceptable in their system, absolutely embracing hybrid learning and online learning as we speak. We're also seeing how online learning, and this goes back to some comments in the chat, can actually create a route to new markets and new students for universities. But it's also really clear that hybrid learning for nearly all of us is likely to dominate post-COVID undergraduate offerings. I don't think any of us believe we're going back to a fully, what often gets described as face-to-face -face mode. There's also a reality though, that in the age of the consumer, we as higher education providers, like many other industries that came before us, are going to have to be more dialed in to learner preferences and think about really taking advantage of an omni-channel approach in the way that we deliver our, our education. And then finally, I think that integrated approach to digital and physical course design and delivery clearly, and it's absolutely understood by me, poses many structural, philosophical, pedagogical challenges for us as institutions. And if you look in the chat, you see people, you can see the tension bubbling around in the chat that absolutely dots that exclamation mark that Maria and Lucy and I are not saying this is easy. We're not saying everybody just should run to, I think somebody put it in the chat as the catnip of these bright, shiny objects. But we are, what we are saying is there is a new norm and it is going to challenge us. And we had better start thinking about our structured data, our program architecture, about how we can put all of our, our learning offerings in a more coherent framework, because unless we do that, we're never going to be able to deliver um, to our full potential. And I think this is a wonderful graphic because it sort of shows what's going to be required for us as we think about our different types of students over time being able to use the best of on-campus, the best of synchronous, the best of asynchronous, but do that without having to create a new type of offering each and every time. We want to take advantage of the technologies that can help us provide fantastic learning. 
And so I'm going to hand back to you, Lucy, at that point, and let's see what our, our um, uh, participants have to say today about some of those trends. Awesome. Thank you so much for um, all of your insights, Maria and Martin. That's um, really brought a lot of those shifts um, to life. But for those of you who haven't been in the chat already, it's your time to shine anonymously, if you like. Um, two questions, um, and you'll see a poll come up again in that poll tab. Um, I think it's just appeared. First question, as you think back over those four shifts, which of those strategic shifts do you think has the greatest opportunity to create a better future? And let's put brackets for higher education. Um, where is there the greatest opportunity to create a better future for this wonderful space in the education industry? Um, and to extend on your answer, please feel free to go nuts in the chat. Let's see what's happening in the polls. Oh. Okay. Credentials has dropped. It's out of favor, Maria. It's gone. <laughs> Omni channels up there. Education work nexus is up there. Okay, Ma Martin, you've done a good job on your two topics because they are up there as, as big opportunities. That's super interesting. Um, just feel free as we continue to, in fact, let's just see what's come out into the chat. Some people are saying that they wanted to choose um, all three of them um, or all four of them in some things. If you can't see the poll, just um, make sure you can um, see to the right of your screen, extend um, the chat and the polls and the people are all there. I think what's interesting here is Education Work Nexus and, and Omnichannel Learning are, um, you know, 36% each. Um, so the, the, the vast chunk. And what that speaks to me is relevance, relevance to students, you know, thinking about what learners want and not only now in terms of the way they learn, but also in the future about, you know, the relevance for industry, relevance, you know, connecting higher ed closer into to learners and into, into the world, um, you know, outside. I think, I think that's wonderful. Mm. I also uh, think it's a reflection, Maria, of the pressure that we're all under right now in higher education. We're feeling that pressure coming at us from the world of work. We're feeling that, that pressure of dealing with returning students and having to make sense of hybrid in real time. But while that's going on, we are conscious of the disruption going on for lifelong learners and governments are telling us they want short courses. And, and so I, I think the 37 and 33 is also a little bit like a blood pressure cuff. It's telling us, you know, sort of what's driving up the, the heat for us right now as well. Yeah, and someone did point out that, um, you know, you had the phrase for higher education and you, you reinforce, you know, who's benefiting from what. And we could have had three or four versions of this question, you know, what's better for individual learners? What's better for the future of humanity? Um, there's so many variations on this question that I would love to ask. Um, but before we kind of wrap things up, um, I don't know why we're ending on a negative, but which ones? This is such an important part of the conversation. We need the black hats in the room. Which ones are you concerned about that may have a negative impact? And you can decide whether it's for higher education or humanity or governments or whoever. Um, but which one um, could take us down a bleak road? Oh. Oh, These are all, some of the most oh, interesting no, polls up. we've had. It's great. Okay, so now it's between credentials, new credentials and borderless competition. Borderless. Look how it's flipped, Lucy. Mm, mm, absolutely. Well, at least it's consistent. <laughs> yeah. How interesting. I'm not at all surprised about, I'm not at all surprised about borderless competition uh and and you know, i'll just speak for myself i think mm. that's very challenging to the existing regulatory framework policy framework funding frameworks that are largely defined at a state or national level mm. and as those borders open up i'm sure many of us are concerned about so what will the quality of the learning experience and outcomes be as you know those those borders break down and these different types of competitors enter our space. So uh, if, if you'd asked me to predict, that's the one I, I would have thought would come out for this group that you've got with us today. Yeah, brilliant. Any final comment from me, you, Maria, before I move to the, uh, the wrap slide? 
No, I mean, the, uh, the only thing is, you know, this is a strategic shift shift and things move. And so we obviously we keep an eye on this, as do all of you in the in the in the session, because you're here and, and interested in these topics. And um, I, I think each one of these could be a whole exploration on itself. I see there's a lot of um, expertise in the room. So I look forward to our our next set of um, our sessions where we can bring everyone together again. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and just to wrap up, I mean, I was looking at your introductions just as Maria and Martin were speaking, and we have people in the room from Norway, from Spain, from Northern Ireland, from Mexico, from Argentina, Belgium, Texas, Brazil, Sheffield, somebody's from my northern roots. Um, I love how late you've stayed up to join us, um, and it's wonderful. And there have been some absolutely wonderful um, chats and quotes and challenges um, in the chat. I think the, the one about micro-credentials being catnip for politicians um, is up there with my favourites. Um, the point of having the chat open and to um, keep the conversation open and to keep challenging is because this is, as Maria said, a shifting conversation. And one of the ways we invite you into the conversation, um, and let me put that as a link in the chat as well, um, is to be part of the Global Higher Education Network. That means you are um, first to find out when we're running webinars like this. Next year is looking like a year where face-to-face -face events are happening again. Um, so there will be invitations to some wonderful things going on there, um, more opportunities to participate um, in global research and so on. So please do join um, and be part of that. Um, final thank you to Maria and Martin for joining us. It's been um, such a pleasure to have you contribute to the conversation. Um, and I am going to now hand over to Bethany. Um, if you need to go, please um, go ahead and go to sleep or have your breakfast. Um, if you would like to stay, Bethany is going to walk us through um, the whole and IQ platform and show you firstly where some of this data um, comes from as well as um, the conversations we have on the ground and the intelligence unit that we work with um, but give you a sense for for what's behind the doors over to you Bethany thanks Lucy thanks Maria thanks Martin I I think I speak on behalf of everyone that was absolutely fascinating I learned a lot both from um, things that were being presented during the deck and in the chat it was almost distracting how many interesting nuggets were coming up so it was really wonderful um, I am going to share my screen quick introduction so I'm responsible for the team that supports our really incredible client community which includes leaders across the education education space um, from just making sure my screen is sharing perfect leaders are across the education space institutions governments investors you name it but definitely university clients are a really massive part of our client community and i'm really happy to take this opportunity to give you a very quick overview of ways that they leverage our intelligence to dive into many of these strategic shifts think about strategic growth opportunities for partnership program delivery, and much more. So going to jump in. Perfect. OK, so what we're looking at here is the Holland IQ platform. Um, there is a whole, whole lot to cover, which we definitely won't have time for today. But I'm going to hand select some of our favorite use cases that we know are really value driving for university clients. Before I jump into those, though, I like to orient first by giving you a sense of what we're looking at. This is the core data that we're pulling from in the platform. 91,000 organizations, each with its own unique profile, heaps of investment activities, about 60,000 60, individual profiles as individuals on the market get tagged to strategic activities, an index of 5,000 market research reports that are indexed and tagged across different, different categories, heaps of data sets looking at enrollment numbers, labor uh, projections, population trends. And then this is a number that sometimes is kind of hard to believe, but over 120 million signals of news activity uh, and, and different things happening across the education market. So I think hopefully already apparent from this conversation and the platform in front of you, but a big thing to think about in looking at this is it's a combination of our proprietary technology and human expertise, right? A team of analysts helping categorize things, make sense of it, synthesize it, give you the so what, but also technology really acting as your kind of very vast uh, capture of all the different important things that are going on. 
So one of the, oh, and sorry, before I jump in, uh, one other thing to note is I think it's important to think about different planes of information you can draw from the platform. You can start at a really 10,000 foot view and, and zoomed out looking at everything across a specific topic or, you know, a whole geography of really, really looking at everything from, from a bird's eye. You can also zoom down into different layers depending on the kind of granularity you'd like to apply. So maybe you want to look at a specific topic like boot camps or MOOCs or OPMs or uh, micro-credentials, for instance. Maybe you want to look at a specific organization and its activity or a specific subset of organizations that are really important for you to keep an eye on, maybe some of those kind of borderless competitors. Um, or maybe you just want to really understand a specific market activity and its impact. So on those different tiers, you can really zoom in and zoom out depending on what's most relevant to you. Okay, so jumping in, one of the first things people do when they get onto the platform, definitely our university clients, but everybody, is they will start by looking at an organization profile. So again, 91,000 plus, all looking like this. You're going to see um, a lot, a lot of rich intelligence based on just this view, right? Um, you can see how an organization is tagged on a sector, subsector, and cluster level. You can click into any of those to better understand who is within that ecosystem. Uh, developments is our intelligence unit really bringing out the most important market activity from that deep wealth of ocean of insight from the signals and saying this is really important or this indicates a pattern and those developments will be tagged across all of our different categories but a lot of folks really enjoy being able to go to an organization and see everything that they're connected to activity wise. You can see what markets they're developing stronger footholds in, what partnerships they're initiating, really a lot of information to help better understand the strategic direction and orientation that they're clearly pushing toward. A new feature we've just added that people really, really love, especially when they're trying to understand these new models of relationships and who's working with who and what, what kinds of best practice are, are, are being built that we can better understand and maybe apply to our own operations or work. Uh, relationships is really great. So you can look at any strategic partnerships that organization is connected to, any uh, commercial relationships, et cetera. Really, really rich information here. And then a lot of people also want to say, like, who's also doing what they're doing, right? We know them pretty well and everyone does, but who else is available that we might want to have a relationship with or better understand? So there are a lot of different ways you can look at adjacent players or organizations. Peers is a little bit more of a ranking system. It's kind of us saying like, these ones are matching most closely across how we tag them in our categorization, not necessarily by size or location. Uh, you can also go to similar organizations, which will be a similar list, but slightly different, very related, but looking at related orgs. You can also look at lists that they're part of to understand other spheres of influence or other ecosystems they're connected to. Lists are a really massive part of this platform, which we're going to spend some more time on, but you can build lists as a team or you can tap into lists that we've built for you to better understand what else is going on. And of course, you can always click into the cluster that they're part of to look at who else is tagged alongside them. Okay, so the next thing that our university clients tend to do, especially when they're just jumping in, is really jumping into specific topical areas so they can wrap their heads around and connect all the pieces within categorized topics and segments. So maybe you wanna look at everything higher education. That's that real zoomed out view I was mentioning. Maybe you wanna get a little bit more granular and look at online learning or workforce and skills, content even. Maybe you wanna look at just all of this across Brazil or just higher ed in Brazil, right? So you can do all of those different cuts. And then, you know, we really, really love a framework here at Hall and IQ. Um, some might also be aware of our global learning landscape, which is kind of shorthanded as the periodic table, but we use that as a framework for data in our platform as well. So for instance, you could go to, you know, thousands and thousands of universities, look at anyone, any massive open online uh, courses that would be interesting, boot camps, OPMs, et cetera. You can also jump down into more of the workforce categories here in blue. I'm gonna go ahead and click on upskilling, but as you can see, really lots of ways you can zoom in and look at adjacencies. Here at upskilling, we're looking at um, really a 360 degree view at everything in the platform that relates to upskilling. So maybe you wanna look at all the recent market developments, for instance, right? And maybe you wanna say, I just wanna see anything tagged as a partnership in Europe, 
and you can really filter and you can also tag for recency. So a whole lot of ways that you can dive into uh, the very specific kinds of market activities that are most relevant to you. I'm gonna use a quick example of a development here. And just like how that organization page is really rich with insight on its own, uh, developments also have tons and tons of information, be it quick write-up to help you understand it, tagging to put it in context. We use AI to pull out the key numbers and quotes and links to the entities involved. And you can even dive into the new sources that those would be built from. So right there, really getting a sense of, okay, what's this impact and why is it relevant to us? If I jump back to upskilling, there's tons of other information you can dive into, which I know we don't have time for today. Uh, you can look at notes that our team has written up on the subject. You can look at any of those reports we mentioned that are tagged and you can of course filter by geography as well, pull up key data sets, et cetera. Something else that people tend to do, especially while they're in that stage of like, we're trying to understand everything happening in this particular thing so we can wrap our heads around it. You can also build a custom briefing. So, Here's one that I just built this week, looking at different partnership models and trends in higher education and workforce. And here we've pulled this is about 130 developments from about the last couple of months that we've that I've curated. So I manually selected them to add them in, or I combined them together. And you can filter by category on a high level, drill down to country level, for instance. And once it recategorizes, it's going to do kind of like a shuffle. Yep. Um, you can create a PDF view and share that with your teams to say, this is our digest. We really need to keep an eye on, on all the important things happening around the world in this segment. And you can download it as a CSV or a Word doc, depending on whatever output you need, but super quick, easy way to say, okay, here's a, this is important information for us to act on. Okay, now going a little bit more zoomed in, one of the first things that our university clients will do when they jump into the platform, and I should say this speaks a lot to that like changing, uh, changing competitors space, right? Um, they might say like, first we wanna look at our mo most traditional or nearest and dearest peers. So let's say peer watch list. And this is your, your top 10 kind of closest organizations you need to keep an eye on, right? Maybe these are institutions that do have a really similar offering and you just know that anytime they do anything in the market, you really need to know about it. And so here you can track all that activity. You can look at, again, related lists, recommending other things to think about. Um, over time, the smarter your list gets, the more our, our platform will, technology will make suggestions that can help you kind of enrich it. You can even build this really interesting market map and split them out by country or size to really understand how they're segmented. And of course you can track those developments in more granularity. Something people really, really love, especially when they're keeping an eye on lists, though you can do this for lots of different parts of the platform, is stars, so you can revert back to it really easily and really especially following. This is going to give you a notification anytime anything happens in this list or any change is made. And you can even get those notifications here and trigger a daily email so you don't even have to hop back into the platform to see it. It's a really helpful way to just stay completely on top of all the things you want to see. And while this is a pretty traditional like competitor list, you can build related lists for those kind of changing competitors that are going to have an impact on you, but may not have been the kind of traditional set you would have thought before. Um, maybe they're folks who are having a really big impact on your space and whatever they do in the market is definitely going to relate to you. So you need to keep an eye, whatever that is, you can keep those lists in mind as well. Okay, I know we're almost out of time. I guess one or two more things I definitely wanna make sure that we show is back to this whole thing about um, moving to high flex hybrid and trying to understand what traditional in-person services can be brought or you know connections can be brought into more um, more online hybrid models. A lot of our universities we work with come to us saying, is there a way to bring um, you know like alumni services or um, virtual internships or even you know I've recently heard, mentor mentee platforms into the online space so that we can make that more widely available. And that's definitely something we see quite a lot. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can build those kinds of lists to understand those potential partners for, for connections for buy, build, partner, or understanding what kind of best practices are already out there. 
One is we've pre-compiled a number of lists looking at, say, counseling platforms or um, alumni or, I mean, heaps in here, right? Scheduling, for instance. And we filtered this for higher education so you can really get hyper-focused on that. But you can certainly build your own lists however you like. Maybe you want to go into the studio and use specific search terms or categorize by our own um, organization categories. Whatever it is you want to do, you've got that option. So you can build those lists there too. And if we have literally like two seconds, one more thing I wanted to show folks is um, and it kind of in part and parcel with this idea of identifying organizations to work with. We're also seeing a lot of universities come to the platform saying this is clearly a topic that's of significant importance and it keeps coming up and maybe we want to offer some kind of micro credentialing around it or we want to think about what our role in this could look like. And so they'll build lists around specific topics to understand what key players across the higher education landscape are operating and get a sense of kind of what's already out there. So you can also go both in terms of like strategic procurement and viable partner and also do this to get a sense of what's happening within, within a specific segment or landscape. So I know that was a lot of information. Again, we really did only just scratch the surface and um, I, I very much appreciate the time to share that with everybody. If anyone has any questions, do reach out to us and let us know if you'd like a personalized walkthrough. Um, but thanks. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, that was wonderful. And thank you to everybody who stayed. There were so many of you um, who have extended your stay with us um, to hang on and listen for that. A final thank you. Um, I can see you've been networking and very proactively using that chat, and that is exactly what we wanted you to do. So please continue to do that. Um, please come along and let me put my bit in again. Join the network if you'd like to stay across all of these things. We will go back through the chat and I'm so sure Beth will go and check and see if she can answer some of those questions and get back to you um, on things where she can. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at another session very soon.